Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. It's great to see you here. So you can say hello. We're, we're going <laughs> to. We're keeping this very relaxed. Um, my name is Louisa Benton. I'm the executive director of the Hope for Depression Research Foundation. I'm honored that you're here today, taking time out of your day, for our first annual Healthy Brain, Healthy Mind Symposium. It's great to see teens here too. We have teens on the panel. This is what it's all about. We don't want to talk at you. We want to talk with you. Many, many of you may have come with questions. There will be many opportunities to ask your questions. If you want to ask an anonymous one, that's what your index card is for. Later, we'll have microphones during the question and answer. But also, if during the panel, when the panel is talking, if you are, as Elise said before, swooning to say something, then, then please chime in. We have an amazing panel and an urgent topic, but not a lot of time, so I want to get us quickly acquainted. First off, the Hope Foundation. For the past decade, we've been a leader in depression research. We work with many of the world's top brain scientists to advance the understanding and treatment of depression, a serious medical illness that affects 350 million people around the globe and is the number one cause of disability worldwide, a staggering statistic. That's according to the World Health Organization. You can find more information about us and our brilliant team of scientists for those uh, in your information packet and also for those of you who are streaming live on our website, hopefordepression.org. Also, our founder and fearless leader is here, Audrey Gruss. <laughs> I'm saluting her for her incredible contribution to the field. We were founded not only to drive science forward, but to raise awareness and spark urgently needed conversation around the topic of mental health. First of all, stigma is harmful and often keeps people from recognizing and seeking help for depression or any other mental illness. We reduce stigma by talking openly about depression. But secondly, advances in neuroscience can shape public policy debate on urgent social issues that affect us all. We launched this program, Healthy Brain, Healthy Minds, to be a public forum where we can introduce developing knowledge about the brain in discussion on topics that we're confronting together as a society, topics that define us in our times. Perhaps no other topic is more relevant than smartphones, teens, and mental health. The headlines and Facebook feeds are fraught with concern. Smartphones and social media deliver many conveniences, but at what cost, experts ask. Is technology infringing on our very humanness? Is it harming our brains? The question becomes even more urgent when it comes to our children. In the past decade, we've seen a steady decline in the mental health of our nation's youth. Twice as many teenagers now have depression as a generation ago, and this is not a reporting issue. Tragically, <clears throat> suicide is on the rise. It is the second leading cause of death for ages 10 to 24. Many experts say that the rise of social media is at the root of this crisis. Last year, renowned psychologist Jean Twenge wrote a much discussed article in The Atlantic, have smartphones destroyed an entire generation, in which she points out alarming new trends. Teens these days are suddenly less likely to date, leave home without their parents, less likely to get their driver's licenses. They're putting off adult activities and spending more time alone with their digital screens. And the greater the screen time, the greater the unhappiness. Eighth graders who are heavy users, users of social media are 27% more likely to be depressed, Twenge said. Since then, many voices have joined the debate, many of whom are here today. And many, the, many of them are young and speaking to us from the vantage point of Gen Z. Their voices are critical. Before I introduce them and hand over the topic, just a few quick acknowledgments to the people who've made this event possible. Tanya Higgins, a champion and advisor from the start, the Stavros Niarcos Foundation, and Jimmy Boranak of Finley Galleries. Also in the audience, many influencers in the mental health space, Sarah Gorman from the Jed Foundation, protecting the emotional health and preventing suicide for our nation's teens and young adults. 
uh, Ankit Gupta of the Crisis Text Line, providing free crisis interve intervention via text messaging, and Susan Brody on the board of Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. So let me now introduce the panel. Your programs, also identify them all and, and give their bios. Our moderator is rising star Elise Fox, a filmmaker and activist who last year created Sad Girls Club, an online and in real life community for millennials and Gen Z across the world to discuss mental health openly. Dr. Marianne Shai, medical director at New York Center for Living, serving teens and young adults with mood and substance use disorders. She is also a professor in complementary and alternative medicine health, uh, alternative mental health at NYU. Scarlett Curtis, contributing editor at LUK and also writer for Vogue and The Guardian, who has been writing about mental health and advocating for awareness since 2010. Philip Isle, in the middle, outspoken advocate who has written about his own mental health journey for The Atlantic, Vice, and Salon, to name a few. Dr. Alex Harris, a psychiatrist and neuroscientist who heads the Neural Circuits Lab at Columbia University and part of the remarkable team at HDRF. M. Odesser, our bona fide teenager, <laughs> a 17-year-old who attends high school and is editor-in-chief and co-creator of Teen Eye magazine. Last year, she was named one of Vice's six, six young activists who made history. And Dr. Yalda Uhls, joining us from UCLA. She is a child psychology researcher studying how media affect young people. And she's the author of Media Moms and Digital Dads, a fact not fear approach to parenting in the digital age. So Elise, let's kick it off, shall we? <laughs> okay. let's, I'm, let's start with a question. I'm gonna to talk to you. Since we're all familiar with a Gene Twenge article, let's start with the question. Are smartphones and social media creating a mental health crisis and destroying a generation? Whoever wants to begin can just jump in. And I want to know why you think that as well. How, who is familiar in the audience with that article? I'm not, actually. OK, so I think we have to explain what the article is. Um, would you like one of us? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, this was an article that Dr. Jean um, Twenge, who's at San, San Diego State, and feel free to jump in for the rest of you that have read it, where um, she is, has been doing um, studying generational differences for probably 20 or 30 years. She takes data from NIH, the, uh, monitoring the future data. She's recently um, added some data from UCLA, higher education research. And they basically, every single year, they ask eighth graders, 10th graders, 12th graders, and incoming freshmen the same questions. And Monitoring the Future has been doing it for like 30 or 40 years, same thing with UCLA. So she, has, she took that data and she has, in the last 20 or 30 years, she, she crunches it and she looks for generational differences. So 10 years ago, she was the first person to write about um, the narcissism epidemic, which she, um, she felt was coming, coming out of this data. And in, in um, August or September of last year, she wrote an article in The Atlantic about how um, kids were spending less time in person, more time on the internet and social media. And she correlated that with uh, the a rise of loneliness. There is data that this generation, people now are more lonely than ever. And um, there is, as you just heard, um, data on ri a rise in um, depression and suicide. So her, her assumption, what she was saying, is that perhaps smartphones are the cause of this rise in suicide. So I'm not going to answer the question <laughs> since I went I on and on and on. So I'm going to let you I can guys. definitely speak on that as the resident bona fide teen. I don't know what adjective we're using. Um, so yeah, I think my journey with social media has been very interesting. Um, teen Eye Magazine is a magazine I co-created in oh God, 2014. And it was basically a place for teens to have the ability to share their professional insight on things that matter to them because like we were 13 and 14 and 15 and we realized like, oh, Vogue isn't gonna publish a 14 year old with no prior experience. So we're gonna create an exclusive platform that's for us by us. It's all gonna be online so it can be accessible to teens in every continent. And it is, except for Antarctica because penguins can't read. But um, <laughs> 
But yeah, so I have a very interesting relationship with social media, and I think what's more interesting is if you take a step back and look at why I joined Teen Eye in the first place, I was getting bullied. I was in a very exclusive clique that in middle school and the beginning of high school, this was in middle school, and I was like, and I would go on social media, I would see my friends doing things with Almi that I should have been included in, and so I kind of used social media to get out of that, and I made my best friend, who's still my best friend, she lives in Canada, we've been in person once through social media, I got my job through social media, later I found Elise, who I now am lucky enough to be her assistant through social media, and I think I would be far lonelier without social media because in a community that I don't always feel that comfortable in, I can go on my phone and I can text Elise and be like, I'm having a bad day, or I can text Scarlett and be like, I'm having a bad day, or text my friends in other continents. And I think that's a really exciting experience. But I also, I'll talk about the downsides later, but that's the pro side. <laughs> if I could just sort of make a general comment um, about the, the, since we're starting with the Chunji article, there's a, there's a, a, a general problem with, um, with correlational data um, that you can, you can find associations and there's, the first thing is um, the associations may or not, may not be real. If you look for uh, connections between things and you have enough data, and we live in the age of big data, so you can look through lots and lots of things, you can find all sorts of correlations. So the, the first thing I would say is that when you're thinking about um, research that's reported in, in the news, the first thing you want to know is, did they have any reason to suspect um, that this is something worth looking at, or was it just you know, something that they found by chance? You know, not getting into a, a boring statistics question, all in, in, but just you can find things that are statistically significant, and yet still they could have come about by chance. Yeah. The other, um, the other comment is that um, this kind of this kind of data, and particularly the discussion around it, often is very broad. Um, there is an epidemic of narcissism. There is an epidemic of, of depression. Um, and it's because of X or Y. Um, but as M's co uh, su um, comments suggest, there's going to be variation. There are going to be people who find um, media use very comforting. There are going to be people who find it very anxiety provoking. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not necessarily helpful. It's important to see the general contours of the trend, but it's not necessarily helpful to make sweeping generalizations. Yeah, I, I would add, as, as an addiction psychiatrist who, who focuses on child and adolescent mental health and wellness, we know along with uh, that those correlates are the opioid epidemic. And this is actually a very real epidemic we're facing in this country, um, more so than anywhere else in the world today. And so I, I look at this as what's happening in the United States, what's happening to young people that are number one, using them to use drugs and alcohol and, and dying at an astoundingly high rate. And I wonder if there's a relationship to that with depression and suicidality. I see smartphones and technology as, in a way, the way you can look at nature. Is it a bane or a bomb? Um, the hurricanes we've experienced have been so destructive. Everyone knows when you're going on vacation, you tend to think of sunsets and, and the ocean or the wilderness. Uh, they all come from nature. The reality is that technology is here and it's here to stay. And so I think we're at this point in time where we're trying to navigate how to use it wisely, how to, how to grow um, and address these problems. And I think technology can be a helpful resource. I don't think it's the cause of, of these problems. I agree. What do you think makes social media such a negative thing? Like, what is, what's the cause of it? Is it like moderation? Is it we're exposed to too many things? What would you say? Go ahead. This kind of ties to that and the last question, but I think a lot of the reporting that goes on around, I write a column in the UK for the Sunday Times called the Gen Z hit list, and I get a lot of questions about Gen Z, and I think a lot of the reporting you see around it is focusing on kids that have very kind of privileged upbringings or good lives and good mental health or health anyway and uh, you know not going outside to sit on their 
phones and play computer games or whatever. And I think what is looked at much less is the other side, other side of that. Like I left school when I was 14 because I had a chronic illness and I was in a wheelchair for my whole teen time. And without the internet, I don't know if I'd still be here today. Like it completely saved my life. It was how I found community. It was how I found my education. My school refused to teach me anymore. So it was how I, mm -hmm. you know, got the education that I've got today. It was how I made all my friends, started my career, everything. And I think if we were to be looking more into children with disabilities or mental health problems or, you know, that aren't caused by social media, we'd see much more positive statistics in how much of a tool of communication and community it can be. So, so one of the things, and I'm a media researcher, I study how media affects kids, so I've been doing this for about 10 years, and I used to be in the film business, so I actually understand how media is made, too, so I've been in media my whole life. Um, but one of the things we, we talk about as media researchers is there's always a moral panic mm -hmm. when there is new media introduced. And one of the things that, um, one of the uh, very sort of illustrative examples of this is there was a new media that was introduced at the end of the 19th century that parents were freaking out about, all the adults were freaking out about. Would anyone like to guess? If you you read I my know, book, so don't answer. <laughs> um, if, any, if you haven't read my, if you have not read my book, you can answer. Um, anybody in the audience can shout it out too. What was this media at the end of the 19th century that adults were freaking out about? What was a printing press? Radio, no. Telephone, Telephone no. Email. I was going to say printing press. I don't know. Printing press. <laughs> Um, was was uh, a lot before that. <laughs> However, you are very close. She is close. Anyone want to guess? Newspaper. Nope. Recorded music. Nope. What? Telegram. Telegram. Nope. More it speed. was books. Dime novels. Oh my god. So romance novels. I found something. Um, a newspaper article that was like Horatio Alger was just awful, and young boys were in the library. You know, their parents don't care. I guess. <laughs> Um, today, obviously, many of us wish, I have two children, I wish they read books more. Um, so, you know, this happens over and over again. And I think this is happening, and we, we sort of dipped down for a little, and then the Twenji article actually did bring it back up again. Um, but I think we're going to start adapting, and we're going to see people like you, the younger generation, is, and, and we're seeing millennial parents, too, um, not as scared, and, and also adapting and, and understanding also how to teach their children and not being as scared of it and not, you know, so I'm hoping that we are in the downswing or we'll be able to get through this. Yeah, and adding on to that, you know, I think the new tech, obviously technology will always update things, but I think with the growth of social media, we've had technology in a form that's never been before. Um, there are some statistics that I really don't remember about how much more the brain is processing per day. But it's like now to, I don't want to say to live in the world because that's so cynical, but um, to um, be a part of many industries, you have to be knowing everything. You have to be updated so quickly. And there's so much more information dis dis dissemination than there ever was before, which I think can be very negative and very positive. Because like I'm an... I, I, I feel weird assigning myself the label activist, but um, um, I, I just you're like an you're an activist. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you guys say it. You do um, more than I do. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if that's true, um, but yeah. So like I, when I started getting involved in these causes, I found out about all of them through social media. I started learning about mental illness through social media. I started listening to stories about other people with depression, and as I was getting bullied, not only did I find solace, but um, like you know. When my therapist, I, I didn't like my first therapist that I had, but I still kind of, like people would post tips about panic attacks. And they weren't always helpful, but they were a lot more helpful than anything I was learning in school or in outside resources. And then also, sometimes I would go on Instagram and I'd see all my friends hanging out without me, and I'd be like, wow, that sucks. And I would go into like spurts of really intense depression that were really debilitating. And when Scarlett was talking about how social media basically like kept her going and kept her from just like ends that we don't even want to think about. I related to that so hard. And I think with so much information, there's good and bad. And I think it's not just a single-sided story. Absolutely. I, can I just uh, weigh in? Because I think we're, so far, the consensus would be that um, you know, the, the Twenji article was a complete overreaction. You know, there may be an increase in, in depression, but it has nothing to do with, with social media. So I just want to 
I want to um, put a little balance into, into this um, because there was a study, there have been a, a few studies to, to look directly at this relationship. Um, and I'll start with one that was in 2013 that was still correlational, um, but tried to be a little smart about um, asking whether there was any cause and effect in the matter by looking at um, time one to time two. So the amount of social media use at time one, did it predict how the person um, responded in, about their self-identified their self mood in time two? And they did find that the more a person reported at time one, the more time they had spent in, on social media in time one, correlated with a, a worse uh, mood at time two. Mm -hmm. Then I, we'll, we'll get some. Uh, we'll we're get talking to about the gold, Goldilocks <laughs> hypothesis, yeah, so which then, perhaps you know that's. And then funny. the and the other the other um, the other you know piece of piece of evidence I want to throw in there. And, and again, I don't want people to take uh, this as my uh, my message that uh, there's, this is all bad news. But I do want to put it out there for yeah. discussion. The other um, bit of of data that we can we can play with is that last year someone did a study with a reasonable size, about uh, 1,500 um, people, and they split them up. Um, and they asked, these were adults. These were 30, on average, 35-year-olds. And they asked them, one, to stop using Facebook for a week, um, and the other to continue using Facebook as they had been. And what they found is that people who reported a, a number of different, being different kinds of users. So overall, there was an effect. I'll just start there. Overall, the effect was that the um, people who stopped using for a week reported being happier. The effect was driven by people who reported very heavy use and people who reported passive use, meaning that they just read the feeds without actually posting. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then also, as is, as is common in, in a, a common theme that, that may come up as we're talking about the data, the effect was, was bigger in women than in, um, in men. Although um, we have to note that um, that's sort of a demographic, that, uh, a demographical truth about um, social media users in general, that there are more social, mm -hmm. uh, female social media users. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there because I think we can talk about the individual experience and we can talk about the, the correlation, but there is, a, there is a, a little bit of data to suggest that maybe we, we should be thinking about how we're using it and what, the influ what influences it has on us. Um, I just wanted to chime in as a journalist, and I don't mean to totally veer the conversation away from smartphones. I do have a lot of thoughts on the effects of social media and smartphones on my mental health. But I think there's another question to also ask, which is not are smartphones ruining the mental health of a generation, but what kind of a world are we leaving young people? Um, by that I mean, are young people thinking about what's going to happen when they have an interaction with the police? How many videos of fatal police encounters have they watched? Mm. Um, I teach at a school, a college that costs $70,000 a year to go to. Are they thinking about student debt, which uh, many of them will have for perhaps decades? Are they worried about uh, mass shootings? Um, I've certainly read op-eds by high school students about how terrified they are of going okay. to school. Are they worried about climate change? Are they worried about, uh, shall we say, our unusual president <laughs> and what might happen politically? Um, you know, as somebody who pays attention to this stuff all day long via social media, I perhaps pay too much attention, part of me feels like if you are paying attention and you're not distressed or disturbed, uh, you know, you're not paying attention. So I, I think it's easier to perhaps blame Facebook or blame the smartphone, but I think it's harder to look at ourselves and look at the society we're handing over to these young people. But, but you bring up a good, um, good point because you have more, this generation has more access totally. to that kind of information than any generation before them. Yeah. So we have access, this generation, and kids at a very young age access news, um, and there's disturbing news constantly. And you know, it can go viral, and they can share it, and there are more outlets for them to, um, to uh, consume this information. So in that way, it's, it's a tool, it's a medium. Right. It's not perhaps the actual and stressors, but it does amplify. And, and as a media researcher, there is a lot of evidence that um, underlying um, individual differences, so somebody with mental health problems, somebody, somebody who's um, like FOMO. Do you guys know what FOMO is? Fear of missing out. Um, 
that is exaggerated with social media, as you felt, oh, sure. you know, when you were a middle schooler, seeing your friends at a party you weren't invited to. Um, and for kids that have low self-esteem, and they are often attracted to FOMO, like they, they feel it more, and they can't get themselves off the social media. So they use social media more and more and more. So for, for there are these underlying differences and individual differences. So for yeah. a kid with anxiety, you know, low self-esteem or feels, you know, possibly depressed, whatever, whatever issue there is, um, media and social media can amplify it. It's all the information dissemination and yeah. how it's coming out and if it's mm. helpful and hurtful. And I think a lot of that is like who you're following. I know on Sad yeah. Girls Club, um, yeah. we're very vocal about kind of like shaping your social media to the way mm -hmm. you That's would like. Um, when I was talking to my friend's mom and I was like, oh, I'm doing this really cool panel. And she goes, oh, I mean, you can take this idea for yourself, but I want to tell you this idea I had. Um, she goes, basically what I think social media is, and the main problem with social media, and she's amazing, she goes, um, you're comparing everybody else's outside to your inside. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I heard that too. Is that Jennifer Walsh? No. Uh, I, I, it was Meredith Bluestein who oh. told me that. Yes, I love somewhere. that too. She that is the best she's, line. She's like my second mom. I love her so much. But um, I thought that was a really interesting line. And you know, like, I am very active in like intersectional feminist communities where it's a lot of discourse from people who are intentionally putting out very candid, very honest, very. Um, vulnerable and very uh, supportive messages on social media. Like I know, um, I mean, the only two Instagrams I know here are Scarlett and Alicia Lewis <laughs> before, so I don't know if you guys even have social media or what you post on it, but I know like Scarlett and Elise and I have like all like, I think posted pictures of us like crying at times or being like, I had a really bad day. And that kind of starts a conversation which I think is so valuable. And that's why I, th I when I first found Elise, I was like, oh my god, this is like the future, and I'm so obsessed with her. Um, but <laughs> but um, I, I do think that if I had maybe been following a different type of people, because I've seen people who sometimes only follow a very specific thing and their mental illnesses exacerbate. Mm. And I, um, I, when we were talking I about, mean, as a yeah. psychiatrist, and, and again, my field is addiction, which I will say, compared to other fields of psychology and psychiatry, tends to be a little bit more proscriptive and very vested in studying the behavioral patterns of, of, of patients that we're working with. Um, I see the relationship with social media and technology as another wonderful avenue to intervene on a patient's well-being. Mm -hmm. And so, as a clinician, in this day and age, part of the discourse on how a patient's doing is what is their relationship with social media? Mm. Um, and, and I have the knowledge and experience to, to be able to make informed um, recommendations to a patient on, well, what sites are you visiting and how long are you spending on there? Uh, just as I might prescribe a patient um, who has a questionable relationship with a substance a period of time off of it, I equally have prescribed and can prescribe, let's try and take a break from all forms of media for the next week. Wow. Or if that's too much, say, uh, you're gonna turn off your phone and you're only gonna check it twice a day and you're only going to respond for half an hour to urgent matters. And what happens is this wonderful opportunity for teaching a person how to be curious about their relationship with social media. I think it's something we don't think about. And to me, it speaks to this wonderful opportunity we have to try and understand on an individual basis what's helpful to a person, um, where are they running into two problems. And it's also another tool to kind of uh, explore the drives and motivations that, that a, a person has when, when engaging with this technology. So it's about taking this stance of curiosity uh, about the relationship. Particularly when working with people struggling with addiction, I will say, um, anecdotally at least, this is a wonderful way for people in early recovery to stay connected. Um, uh, it's powerfully helpful, particularly in, in the 12-step model of addiction where sponsorship and connection with others is key to recovery. For people to leave a meeting and collect phone numbers and get text messages on a daily basis just saying, how are you doing, thinking about you, or I'm going to this meeting. Um, and so I think it's, it's about finding a way for us to to utilize this incredible resource in a way that promotes health, wellness, and well-being. Do you think as a whole we're addicted to social media, like this generation 
in particular. And if we are, how do we get like the monkey off of our back? How do we <laughs> move on and like use it appropriately and moderately for the next generation, as you said? I mean, I think even the term of addiction is something that there's a great deal of debate in different communities as to what it means. Are we talking about a compulsive relationship with something? But in the sense of um, having a hard time putting something down and using it more and more and having negative consequences, Again, as an addiction psychiatrist, I think my, my number one go-to with exploring any relationship with any sort of, whether it's a substance or a process, as in a behavior, like for, for some people, addiction can be um, compulsively shopping. You know, you, you have to go buy things and that's how you feel good. So I always start with this idea of trying to take a break from it. And, and again, be curious as to what happens. Um, do I find it very hard to not shop for a week or even for a day? If I do, that tells me there may be something off in this relationship. Uh, I remember this was probably 2010 or 11, and I was still in training. I went to Poland for a, for a wedding, and I had a smartphone at that point in time, but I didn't have one with international capabilities. And I remember landing in Europe and kind of having phantom vib vibration syndrome where I thought something was buzzing on me, but my phone wasn't working. And it took about two or three hours of um, freaking out about the fact that I couldn't just look in the palm of my hand to see what time it was or to, to look up directions. And then I felt utterly liberated, like as if I was in another, beyond another continent, just um, really reconnected to, to the environment in, in time and place, and it became a very mindful experience. And so I, I would encourage everyone here to just try this experiment of not having your phone without the horror of, I don't have my phone, but the liberty of like, I don't have my phone. <laughs> The, um, we're, I work with, uh, I consult with uh, Common Sense Media, which is a nonprofit, and they're doing a, um, they're doing a campaign partnered with uh, Tristan Harris, uh, who used to be a Google ethicist, and now he's left because he believes the technology um, companies are sort of evilly um, addicting us to these devices, and some of the suggestions um, they're just common sense, honestly, which he has, which is, and I think this is sort of how we are gonna get over this moral panic, how we're all gonna start adjusting to this is turn up, I mean, there's a statistic that 93% of people feel phantom vibration. I mean, who in this room, raise your hand if you've ever felt um, phantom vibration. That's not 90, but that's pretty high. Um, I haven't, because, probably because I don't put my phone on vibrate. So I've never, you know, so I don't feel it. You don't have to put your phone on vibrate. You don't have to have notifications for every little thing, you know. You can keep your charger phone outside of the bedroom. There are all these sort of mechanisms that we can all do on a day-to-day -day basis that will help us have a more healthy relationship with our technology. Yeah, and I think in, there's this really great quote in his book, Twitter and tear gas, which is technology is neither good or bad, nor is it neutral. And I think mm. we tend to look at it either as like, all technology and social media is great, or all of it is evil and put down your phone. And I think increasingly, you know, the things that are inside our phones are very nuanced and very different. People are building careers on their phones, people are building relationships on their phones, people are building friendships on their phone. And this idea of, oh, just put your phone down for a week, or, you know, oh, just don't have it on, during this time is more and more unrealistic, but we can be making better choices with everything that we're doing within these platforms. And I actually think we're all really holding back this progress by not looking into what are we actually doing within these platforms. So, you know, I'll give my Instagram to friends and, you know, almost like swap to scroll through and the only people they follow are like supermodels and people <laughs> that make them feel crap about the way they look and people that make them feel bad and they scroll through my feed and it's, People like Elise and M who are talking about politics or mental health, it's amazing feminist illustrators, it's people talking about the environment, you know, and all these different things. And I've made a lot of effort with myself not to just post the good things, you know, mm. to post the bad things, to talk about my mental health, to talk about the whole reality of my life. And unless this is what the conversation could be, but so often the conversation is phone or no phone. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas it should be, well, what's actually happening within the phone? I really love the idea of kind of like accepting it as like, this is something in our culture, this is something that's happening, it's not going to go away, so let's make it the best thing possible. Yeah. Because we're always going to get more advanced and like people are already like posting like memes about like being like an adult and like watching your kid use like, oh God, 
um, the, the thing where, um, God, I'm completely blanking on the word, but like when you like project an image and, and like it talks, I don't, whatever. <laughs> More advanced technology, if anyone remembers the word. Hologram? Shout it out. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking horoscope, which is not at all. <laughs> I have um, a question though, for, the, for those who are, like social media is a part of your career. We have like some journalists on the panel, writers. If it's a part of your career and you have to get on social media after you write this article to promote it and bring more light to it and you also are making a career off your social media and that's how you take care of yourself, like, do you have some tips for moderation? Like, how do you deal? Do you take a break? What is, what's your schedule with social media? I have tips for both moderation and ways to make the experience of social media uh, better for your mental health. Um, one thing I did, I, a uh, decision I do not at all regret was <laughs> deleting the Twitter app from my phone. Mm -hmm. um, so I simply don't use Twitter on my phone. Um, and that is a great way to at least, f you know, get further away from everything that's going on in the world. Another thing I would say is, and I kind of had to figure this out on my own, my, what my own mental health recipe for social media was going to be, and I certainly hope people younger than me are getting classes and curricula, curricula where this is being discussed proactively as opposed to people figuring out on their own. Um, but what I learned is, and this is not a joke, cute animal accounts on Twitter really help. Um, <laughs> it, it helps to uh, break up the bad news wow. with otters and cats and dogs. Uh, but also there are people out there who are posting really remarkable um, things about social media. Matt Haig, the British author, is a wonderful example. Um, I would highly recommend following him. And a guy I interviewed for an article named Dennis Turch, um, who's a, a therapist, and he's just posting kind of wisdom about um, mindfulness and self-care all day long. And he's just one person I followed who had a tangible positive effect on me. And I also unfollowed a lot of people. Mm. <laughs> to go back to Matt Haig, one of the things he tweeted uh, recently was, you know, my recipe for happiness um, don't compare yourself to other people, don't compare yourself to other people, don't compare yourself to other people. And social media is all comparing yourself to other people. Yeah. So um, I think you have more control than you realize over who you're looking at and who you're comparing yourself to. Yeah. If I could just make a comment about, you know, everyone here is fully autonomous on their, on their use of social media, but people start using social media really young. Um, and there's a role for parents in, in discussing the kind of things that um, all of us have sort of figured out or are fumbling towards. Um, parents have wisdom that they can share with their, um, with their kids about how to use social media in, in moderation um, and also uh, to set um, boundaries and guidelines and an open space to, um, to discuss what happens if those get crossed. Um, for instance, uh, just as a very concrete example, it's probably um, not a good idea. Most of us, I, I'm, and I, myself included, um, sleep with our phones nearby and on. Probably not a good idea, not a good health practice, certainly not for um, a young kid. Um, so, so even setting a limit like that can um, introduce the idea that um, you're in control of your technology and your right. technology is not control of you, and that you can set the, in, the um, frame or the uh, boundaries and the guidelines for the encounter with technology. And if you have a kid, that's a really good thing to model, keeping it outside of your phone, charging it downstairs at a young, you know. I think I've seen, I have parents obviously and three younger brothers, and so I kind of am in this middle position. And something I've definitely noticed is my parents lived the majority of their lives without social media and then you know it kind of came in and my mum became very obsessed with Twitter and my dad <laughs> is very obsessed with a game called Word Cookies that he <laughs> loves. Um, and they actually have a lot more trouble moderating their own yes. use than my younger brothers do. Mm. My younger brothers have been on social media as long as they can remember. When they're with their friends, they're actually very rarely on their phones, you know, because when they're on their phones, they're talking to their friends. So as soon as <laughs> their friends are there, they're not on their phones. When they're talking to me, they're not on their phones. You know, we all, I think what people don't talk about as much is we are all very quickly developing methods of using these and slotting them into our own lives, whereas I think a lot of older people maybe project the way that they feel about it, which is, I was very happy with my life, and then this thing came in, and now I can't get off it, and I can't <laughs> yes. stop playing word, yeah. yeah, I can't stop playing word cookies. You know, I'm talking to my dad, and he's playing this game, and that never happens with my little brothers, because yeah. they yeah. know the risks, and they know how yeah. it's in there, yeah. Well, that's, that's part of the adaptation. 
like I'm, I'm just because curious. I think they've yeah. been with a friend and seen them texting and gone well this is awful I don't want this to happen like yeah. I'm just gonna put it down you know it's the same as you learn what foods you like and what foods make you feel good and I'm not gonna eat so much pizza today because it doesn't make me feel good this, this is all happening I think the correlations between tech and diet are actually very similar you know it's not no food or food it's well what are you putting yeah, in your body right. what are you putting in your feed what are you consuming and I have two thoughts on that first of all um, so I do keep my phone right by my bed which is not the best thing and many people discourage me from doing it but sometimes my anxiety functions in a way where I just like cannot stop thinking and there's two apps I want to recommend to everyone um, one of them, my friend, she's 16, her name's Amanda, and she created this app called Anxiety Helper. And it has like really comprehensive guides to like how to deal with panic attacks, how to deal with breathing, resources to help you if you're in a more dire situation. And I've used that app more times than I can count. And if I'm just feeling like so distressed towards bedtime, using the app will help. I also use um, Inside Timer, which is the only meditation app that's ever worked for me. Um, and if I can fall asleep and my mind is just going like millions of miles an hour, I'll play a meditation, keep it next to my bed, and it's the only thing that can get me to fall asleep. Um, the other thing I want to also say um, is like, so some of the time if I am with friends, I will be on my phone, but it's either like me sort of preserving memories or like taking a picture of them and then I set it at the background of my phone and it makes <laughs> me feel really happy. Or sometimes I think there's a lot of... Um, we were talking about how mainly women identifying people are on social media. And I think there's a lot of beauty standards. So whenever there's good lighting, I like take a picture of myself and I'm like, okay, I know my angles now. Like I feel, and my mom will always be like, why you are just like constantly taking videos of yourself. Like I don't understand why you have to look at yourself. And I feel kind of like there's a lot of empowerment in curating um, your own sort of beauty standard. And I think it can, I mean, there are, definitely, there are definitely people on Instagram that I'm obsessed with that I'm like, I, I wish I could, had their face. And it has pointed out things that I don't like about my face, but then I can take it into my own hands. And like posting a selfie that I feel good about, like that's long-lasting validation that I appreciate. So I have a question from the Crayles. <laughs> and I'm going to ask this to the doctors. <laughs> what are the most effective non-pharmaceutical prescription drug treatments for depression? Ooh, non-pharmaceutical. Mm -hmm. Slash prescription. Slash prescription. Oh, this is complicated, I think, with all that. I guess and or <laughs> drug treatments for depression. I, I would say that the answer to that question is that um, it's very personalized and uh, it isn't, there isn't a, a one-size-fits-all answer and it's something that uh, should be worked in close consultation with a talented doctor. I also think there are different kinds of depression, and so it depends on is this clinical depression, and if it is a clinical depression, how severe is it versus um, maybe not meeting criteria for clinical depression. We know there are so many effective strategies to address depression. Um, everything from exercise or bioactivation has been shown to be uh, just as effective as pharmaceutical medications for mild to moderate depression. So this could be 30 minutes of aerobic exercise three to four times per week. There's a lot of evidence to suggest um, green space therapy. So if you can exercise outdoors instead of in a gym, that's going to be more effective. Mm. Um, a lot of research on things like yoga as well as music therapy, so these holistic practices. Um, and then in terms of medications light and light therapy, um, in terms of medications, uh, and, and I think this is why Hope for Depression Foundation is so uh, remarkably helpful, we are really limited right now to a handful of classes of medications, and we haven't really developed a whole lot in, in the last 20 years beyond... 50. What's that? 35 years. 35 years. And so, you know, when we started this discussion, just talking about the increase in rates of suicide and depression and this, this correlative at best link with uh, smartphone technology, I think this issue at large is speaking to, um, I don't want to say the failure of, of the mental health community, but definitely a, a call to action to really rethink how we are addressing these problems. Um, we talk a lot on the Sad Girls Club platform about like lazy self-care. So it'll be, I stayed in bed all day, but I did a face mask, so that was my form of self-care. 
If you were to give any tips on your lazy self-care method or things that get you out of bed when you're feeling down, what would you share? I'll mask it everybody. I, mean, I, I think I was clinically depressed. I wasn't diagnosed when I was uh, 30. And the only thing that helped for me was yoga. Wow. Mm -hmm. Exercise has never really helped me. And I tried Prozac, it didn't work. So oh, well, I'm on, a, I'm on medication. I'm on Zoloft, and I have clonopin for extreme anxiety situations. And I mean, no, that's not my least self-care. Come back to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there are a lot of things that we know. Um, let's, let's broaden the scope a little bit and talk about stress, which um, is a, a major part of all of our uh, modern lives, and, and particularly um, in the lives of teens, um, I think uh, three out of four teens in a 2013 survey reported having at least one symptom of stress um, in, in the last month. So, so stress is a, um, a major factor, and we know that it's a major factor as well that leads to, um, that leads to depression. So perhaps with a lazy self-care, if I could you know, sh shape your, your question a little bit, could be applied more broadly than to people who are, are just having um, full-blown depression, but even as a preventative. And, and we know that there are a lot of things that sort of can, can lead to resilience um, uh, in the face of stress. So um, having an active coping style, a problem-solving approach, um, meditating, exercising, reaching out and interacting with friends, um, um, let's see, yoga, um, just, a, just a few. Yoga has completely transformed my mental health as well. I do it, it took me a long time to come to it, but I do it every day and it has helped me as much as my medication. Journaling, is that what you Yoga. Said? Yoga, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's funny, social media was actually, this is kind of one of the examples of a downside because one of the reasons I didn't do it for so long was because the only yoga I was getting access to was kind of people posting about yoga on social media I and mean, it was all these very beautiful blonde girls like <laughs> on the beach and I was like well this isn't going to help me it's definitely not for me and now I do it you know in my pajamas in the morning like definitely not looking like people on Instagram <laughs> yeah. but it's completely helped yeah and another thing I don't know I think there's a lot of research I don't know about if you know this but going into these kind of anxiety apps and mental health apps and self-care apps and one experience I've had is with kind of obsessing and anxiety and racing thoughts, I found a lot of audiobooks have really helped mm -hmm. because it kind of, when you're having that racing thoughts, it helps to distract you, which is also why I sleep on my phone by my bed, yeah. but kind of with an audiobook. And journaling, I mean, that's, I, I journal, I've journaled since, you know, middle school, and um, I think that's, there's, there's research that shows that's effective, sure. yeah. yeah. I think um, kind of altering how much you're thinking, I find like when the depression gets really bad, sometimes my mind will just kind of, like I'll get very depersonalized and I won't really be able to focus on anything and then, then I push myself to kind of either reach out to a friend that I know I can trust and I know will be able to be empathetic or um, I also journal a lot. I don't know how many journals <laughs> I've filled so far. Um, but then also on, on times when I'm really high anxiety, and I know that this is mainly discussing depression, but in those times when my mind is just like going everywhere, I just kind of try to like, okay, slow down. Like one of the things I learned is like listen to one song over and over and over and listen to everything but the lyrics. Listen the first time just to the drums, listen one time just to the piano. Like that. And that's a really helpful tip. Um, for me at least, um, and I, I found that it's kind of checking in with yourself, saying like if maybe if you feel dull and dry, you doing your face mask, taking a shower, yeah. wiping your body with baby wipes if you can't get that far. <laughs> I'll dig it. I have another question. To what extent do you think that others posting their enjoyable parts of their lives has a ripple effect on teen minds, or more specifically, their confidence? I, was I mean, that's, child that's fear of missing out. Um, and, or also, you know, the curated life, the perfect life. And I think one of the issues is, um, is when kids get phones at this, you know, at right now, they get on social media, you know, they get a phone and they're going through tween years. So that makes it very, very hard for a parent. In the, you know, when I was growing up, tween years were challenging, um, you know, for my parents, but, um, and they're challenging, you know, 
in and of themselves, but now kids are getting phones and they're getting social media. So, you know, they're pushing us away and spending their time with their friends and their peers, and that makes it feel overwhelming as a parent. Um, but they're really obsessed with their friends, not necessarily the technology. And, and I actually thought it was very encouraging that you said that your brothers, when they're in person, they put the phone down, right? So it's like, and that is actually, kids still prefer to be together face to face. Sure. It's just these things connect them to their friends when we've overscheduled them, we don't let them run around. Um, sorry, I'm off the question. No. <laughs> but, but the reality is that um, when they're young and at that age when their social cognition is turning on, they're starting to understand there's a whole world out there paying attention to them. Then they're on social media and they're paying so much attention and they don't understand it's a curated life. They don't understand that what people are posting is um, you know, a choice that they've made. And so it's very challenging for a young, younger child to figure that out. <laughs> when you were, yes, you, you, you're our younger child. I what think, were you saying, Scarlett? I think, again, in a lot of these conversations about comparison, we're forgetting that like beauty standards have always existed. Yes. You know, Naomi Wolf wrote the beauty myth 30 years ago. This isn't something that's new. Um, if you look at all women's magazines, all women portrayed in the media, like this is something that's been going on forever. I think something that I like about now is we do have the option of having less gatekeepers and being able to kind of rewrite these standards and re mm. redo this ourselves, you know, without the need of like a production company to find your film or an yeah. editor to find your article. And I think if you're feeling this stress, you know, one of the reasons I love following both of you is you do kind of, you're curating your own ideas about beauty that maybe society hasn't told you fit the mold. And also about being a woman, you know, allowed to be sad, allowed to do all these things that we've been told we aren't. And, we wouldn't have had the option of that 30 years ago because you'd never have got it published by Vogue. So I think yeah. that's a good, good thing. point. Charles. I think one thing that's different, though, um, and I agree with everything you've said so far, but it, to add to that um, is that um, there didn't used to be a series of likes um, and pro you know, when, when there were standards uh, posted. So it's very personal. When, when, you, yeah. put out, when yeah. you put out your picture, your selfie, and you're waiting to see how many likes um, it gets. Um, so there's, this isn't just anecdotal, but there's research to show that when people get likes, um, it profoundly affects how they're, they're feeling and what, um, what parts of uh, their brain are active, and that we also know that um, that, that changes developmentally over time, um, that younger, um, uh, younger kids are, are relatively unaffected by um, by the likes they're by being liked either in a chat room or, or um, on an, on an Instagram picture. But then, as they get older, that the salience of that um, has a sort of U-shaped curve where it gets um, it gets it reaches a peak in late adolescence and then starts to wane. Um, that I don't think is anything unique about social media. Um, if you had done that experiment in real life, you would have the same effect. But it is a, um, reflective of the experience of people um, in terms of putting their identities out there and having it commented on. Can I jump in? <laughs> I just want to get through a couple oh. more. Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Let's do it. Hi. Question for the panel. Um, I would really appreciate your insight on. I wanted to ask, what are some examples where social media has promoted mental health? And how do we, as a general population, create more of that? That's a great, I think great question. question. Can I can you speak to this as well? What do you, by promoting mental health, do you mean? Like awareness? Like awareness or creating a, a positive impact. Mm. I think Elise can definitely. Yeah, I want this. to hear your answer. I think a big part for me when I decided to talk about mental health issues, I just looked internally and I just thought being vulnerable was like the biggest thing I can do on my end. Like I didn't, I don't know the cure, I don't know many concrete things, but I think that sharing your stories and your personal experiences are only going to inspire people and keep the ball rolling with the conversation, and also just creating community where people know, like, okay, I know Elise is very, very depressed. I can maybe ask her a question about things when I'm feeling down, or I can go to Sad Girls Club and also receive statistics or positive affirmations when I am feeling down. So I think it's just like 
creating community, but also being vulnerable and not just showing the best moments of your life, showing the in-between mm. moments and showing the real moments that happen. So, mm. so I would say a couple things. Um, I'm a guy who has struggled with mental health issues, and I've written about men and mental health in particular. And I think social media, when it's done well, has this amazing kind of um, accelerated stigma diminishing effect. Yeah. I'm writing a piece now where I'm writing about this remarkable trend in early 2018 of um, A-list men coming forward to talk about mental health issues. Mm. Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Michael Phelps, Brendan Fraser. Um, the list kind of goes on and on. And it's Kevin Love, the uh, Cleveland Cavaliers player, wrote a remarkable piece about his anxiety. And what I'm seeing is it seems to be a cumulative effect. It seems to be building off itself, this men coming forward talking about their mental health issues. It, I think social media is adding to the momentum, and that's a good thing. The other quick thing I'll say is I was a journalist for, I've been a journalist for about a decade, and for the first nine years, I never wrote about myself or mental health. And as soon as I did, um, for some reason, they were the most shared articles I had ever written, which was extraordinary. I don't quite know what it means, um, but I know that people found my pieces via mental health, um, via social media, and they reached out to me, which in turn helped my mental health because mm -hmm. they were, you know, having value, finding value in what I wrote. And so there was, there was this kind of positive reinforcement thing going on thanks to social media. I think quite simply it's all in terms of narrative and I think for a very, very long time we've had one specific narrative and I think with social media, like the most amazing thing about social media and the thing that I'm most proud about maybe my generation is that we have the power to shape our own narratives and when I go on social media I see everything from like people talking about their mental illnesses, I see kids who are um, like um, gender non-conforming and trans and non-binary who are sharing tips online for um, not being in supportive households and being like, here are subtle ways. And I think all of these support systems kind of breed. And I think that if you let these narratives show authentically and you curate your life to be all the moments and not just the good and not just the bad, you're 10 out yeah. of 10. We have to teach. The, the other, the other um, thing is that there's unprecedented access. You know, we, we asked before about what might some of, the, some of the causes be for increase in depression and suicide, and we didn't really come to a, an answer, because in part because we don't, there is no answer. Um, but one thing that we know is true is that there isn't sufficient access um, to a mental health provision. and. Social media is um, is getting around that. So, for instance, um, there's a there's crisis support texting, but there's also Seven Cups, which uh, um, is sort of online um, therapy that's free and available to anybody. So, there's a lot of resources that um, wouldn't be available otherwise, and and um, that are now becoming available and p are publicized on social media as well. One of the greatest. Um the most devastating thing about mental illness is just how isolating it can mm. be. And so just this ability to, to connect people, to take away the isolation, I think is the most powerful thing about Community. these technologies. Yeah, I when I first started going through depression, I was 15 and I had very bad PTSD and depression and anxiety and literally thought I'd like invented it. I was thought I was the only person in the whole world that had <laughs> ever been through any of these issues and everyone else was completely happy. and. For the last three years, I'd had a knitting blog, um, which was kind of how I found my community when I was ill and physically couldn't move. I could knit. And um, I just thought, like, this is mad. I'm going through all this, and I'm going to write something about it on this blog that had previously only been about knitting. And it turned out everyone in my <laughs> knitting community also had depression, which is, <laughs> made me make sense. And it's like exactly what you said. My knitting, my knitting blog's got, like, two comments. This got hundreds, and just all these people saying, you know, I've been through this too, and it, I'm, my life's never really gone back since. You know, it's now I'm completely open about it. It's what I talk about more than anything, and it's, as you said, helped a lot. And I think you just have to take that first step, and all your knitting friends might also be depressed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> knitting, there's a correlation. Yeah. Yes, yeah. knitting is the problem. We have another question. <laughs> so uh, it's all knitting. Okay, no worries. Uh, one of my que my question is. You know, with my children, when I was their age, I was able to make mistakes without the whole world knowing. Mm. And I feel with everything being videoed and everything happening um, online, that there's a lot more public shaming. Yeah. And that's really one of my biggest concerns with social media. And I just want your feedback and what you think about that. And um, 
you know, I think that I'm trying to teach them, be careful what you put online. Mm -hmm. But they're also kids and they make mistakes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so this generation needs to learn. It's a very different world. You can be kicked out of college. You know, adults make mistakes. Um, and the same thing happens to them. So, you know, some of the things, w digital citizenship is, mm -hmm. is something that we talk a lot about. Common Sense has a, um, has a K through 12 um, lessons where you teach kids how to have a positive digital footprint. Mm -hmm. And yet they're still developing, they're not gonna listen, but if you're teaching it at the school level and you're teaching it at home, and then hopefully the peers are also reinforcing this, you know, and get, what I talk about a lot is teachable moments. Use what's in the news, the mistakes that kids make, adults make. There's always a mistake. Sexting happens, and people share that, and that, um, you know, they can get caught. They can be um, named, you know, a sexual offender. There's talk about these things with your child over and over again. Encourage digi digital citizenship in the school, There's, and yeah. don't stop. Yeah. No. The other piece is, I, I think it there really needs to be a curriculum across the board, both in terms of, I was talking to a friend who's a teacher and, and asked her about bullying and how they address it in the school. And they don't. this teacher yeah. said, she's more afraid of the parents and the bullying as a teacher she receives from parents uh, than, than the kids. <laughs> and so I think going back to the uh, cit digital citizenship, um, I think we need to do a lot in this area, both role for modeling, <laughs> which parents, is that is. as it's well the as role their, modeling their, the parents, their children. You know. And then the piece on sexting, we were before entering the stage having a little conversation over there about sex education and how it happens. And it, apparently it's not really happening in most uh, schools beyond, what, 45 minutes your senior year. But um, sexting education as well, I think, needs to well, be a, a piece of it. Piece the thing of with this. sexting is that if you are under 18, even if it's completely consensual, it counts as child pornography. So be careful, um, even if it's between two minors. What, one thing I'll say, and it's not a solution to the problem you posed, but it is maybe a text for that curriculum, which is the journalist John Ronson wrote a great book called So You've Been Publicly Shamed, mm -hmm. um, which I would highly recommend. It's uh, both educational and certainly a cautionary tale if you want to assign it perhaps to your kids um, for kind of a scared straight situation. Um, <laughs> I would recommend uh, John Ronson, So You've Been Publicly Shamed. Yeah, that's great. The last thing. Scarlett, what are you going to say? Yeah, I just also think stigmas are changing, which is something that I think is a positive result. You know, I have talked a lot about my history of mental health online. I've posted pictures on my Instagram of a vibrator. Like, I've posted things online that a few years ago would have been seen as, oh, never tell anyone you've got mental health problems in a job interview, never talk about these things in public. And, you know, me being open about my mental health has never affected me in my education and in mm. my career so far, which is a result of the industry I'm in, but also, I do think these things are changing for the better and we're all, everything we have is all going to be online and we're all going to have to get better at accepting that there are but, less boundaries. And but it's not necessarily, I mean, some of, like, the kids at Harvard, did you hear about that, right? Yeah. So, no, I, I mean, some that's of this, you, you yeah. just have to talk to your kids yeah. to be something they might say face-to-face -face jokingly with a yeah. friend. It won't come across on social media. The opening of the, that book, uh, you know, with the woman, the publicist that said, I'm going to Africa, I might get AIDS, yeah. and that went viral. She lost her job. So there's, you know, it is very important to think about consciously. I mean, you're a journalist. That's a very specific job. You know, yeah. so consciously about, and parents have to think about it, too. We're posting kids of our kid, um, pictures of our kids starting at 2. They're going to turn into teenagers and maybe not be so happy you posted a picture of them in the bathtub, you know. I mean, we have to think about this as well and as a society start having these conversations. And, really and along that line, though, is also parents are freaking out about this, and it's understandable, but, you know, if nothing else, going back to stress and how we cope, we have to learn to deal with a lot of unknowns. That's just the reality of this day and age. And so um, to the extent parents can not stress as much, I think that would be one of the greatest gifts you can give to your children. And, and understand that you know everything that's going on right now is in real time and it's a work in progress. And the real key to managing stress and anxiety is recognizing that it's always going to be there. Theory, it's going to get worse. And so our job is to see how we can move through it. it it's not getting rid of stress. It's, right. it's learning to live with it. I just okay. want to. Yeah, we have one more question. 
Hi, uh, my name is Justina, and uh, hello. Hi. I, I've been wanting to jump in and jump in the whole time <laughs> you guys are talking. So I kind of like lost my original question when I raised my hand. But on that note, um, I just find it so interesting how you know we're talking about social media um, and 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 depression, and it's I, I I believe it's all about connection is what we're all missing mm. and and seeking, which is why there are pros and cons on social media. We're connecting, and we're also realizing how we're not connecting via social media. And I do believe it all stems from the home, and uh, I I. I I feel for parents because I've never been a parent, but I grew up with mine. <laughs> My mother ha had me at 17, so we grew up together, you know, and I'm sure if she had social media, she would be exposing her ups and downs on social media, um, finding, trying to find a community. Um, and I, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, the label depression you know, it, it seems that we all kind of have it, right? <laughs> we all kind of have stress. We all kind of have depression. So is it actually a concrete thing? Is it some, it's just something that we all go through, just like breathing. We all breathe. We all deal with stress. We all deal with depression. You know, it's such a heavy word that shouldn't be heavy. You know, it should be as, as light as that in, to an extent because we all go through it. Mm, it's not as taboo as... I, I think We're what you're it to be. saying is very true. Um, every mental health diagnosis or experience is something all humans can experience. The thing with depression, and when we talk about it at least clinically, is the amount of time a person spends in that state of depression becomes, for the most part, every day and all the time. And it's not just the amount of time you're spending in that state of depression, it's how much it's impacting your functionality. So when we, when we clinicians talk about depression, we're talking about a, a very serious debilitating disease, one that is so dangerous it can, can make a person end their life early um, or can take away their ability to go to work or go to school or be with their family. And, and there are a number of biologic or medical consequences to, to depression. Um, to speak to your comment about connectivity and, and, and actually connecting to people, I, I, I think we could all agree that that's such an important part of um, coping with any kind of stress, with anxiety and, and with depression. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but I guess um, I, I've been there. I, I, I've, I've suffered suffered with depression all my life. It wasn't until I was removed from my current environment that I was able to uh, realize that it was on a on a on a scale a communal thing. Mm. But my environment was a toxic place, mm -hmm. which was w why I brought up the whole parenting issue and I was in a very dark place which people would you know considered clinically depressed but I didn't take medication mm -hmm. I just changed my environment mm -hmm. and and like these two women I, I found a community where I can connect with you know so I don't know what my point is <laughs> uh, it, necessarily I, it's more of like just a conversation um, but uh, I, I think it's all about environment, and I there there are pros and cons, like we're all saying with social media. But I think there's a huge pro because those who cannot physically change their environment, they can at least go there. Yeah, yeah. I do think media. that's extremely important. Like we say all the time, like representation matters. Mm. Before I started Sad Girls Club, I didn't know any woman of color who was succeeding and excelling in life that was like happy and had depression and anxiety and was like killing it in their careers. So. I was like, okay, I, I think I'm doing a good job. Let me be that representative, you know? And a lot of women of color, girls of color from around the world were saying like, now I see myself in you. Like, I know that it's okay that I have this and I can talk about it now and I have a place to talk about it. So I do feel like, absolutely, like community and not having that isolating feeling is like the most empowering thing for sure. Can, can I just make two quick plugs for educational resources about depression that were really helpful to me as somebody who started out knowing virtually nothing? 
Um, you can look up the DSM criteria for depression, which were really eye-opening to me. There's actually, and you guys are the, the, <laughs> to do this, but for me as a, as a lay person, it was interesting that there's actually a diagnostic checklist of symptoms <laughs> that you look for that tell you when a person is depressed. And another is Andrew Solomon's TED Talk or mm -hmm. TED Talks about uh, clinical depression are really helpful to me. Um, he is just a wonderful communicator about it. And you know he said this thing, which I ended up quoting in an article that, um, or maybe I'm going to misquote, but the opposite of um, depression isn't happiness, it's vitality, um, which was really eye-opening to me about, I wrote a piece about how depression can manifest as kind of numbness, and people think of it as the opposite of happiness when it's, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, uh, much more complicated than that. Absolutely. Yeah. We have another question over here. Hi. Um, I'm Ava, I'm in seventh grade. I'm, I guess I could categorize as a teenager, I don't know, but I'm here because my mom brought me here. Yeah. <laughs> she's kind of she's kind of concerned. I don't know why, but you know, that's life, right? Um, so I have a question. So you're talking a little bit about how likes affect, like, what teens think of themselves, like, I guess, by standing, like, to that. I have Instagram. I, I don't really care that much about my likes, but it's like, oh, darn, it only got mm -hmm. X amount of likes, which kind of brings me down a little bit. But I wouldn't say that it controls how I feel about myself. But um, like I was, I was thinking, does all social media apply to the theory that like this is happening to teenagers like with mental illness and stuff? Because like some forms such as like Snapchat, I'm just using an example, it doesn't really categorize based off of likes or views yeah. or anything mm. of that sort, which I feel but it's like, I think it's different, like separated from that. Um, and, I, and I'm just wondering, is it still like, like supporting the cause of anxiety to teens and others? I think what you're speaking to is so amazing and so interesting because the truth is the platforms that actual teenagers are using are changing every day and the, form, the ways in which they're using them and the forms they're taking and I actually don't think much journalism or research is going into any of that. You know, no one's doing research into Finsters, which is the, the, what my brothers use for everything. You know, no one's doing research into Snapchat and YouTube they communities. Are. Yeah, but they just haven't been published. Yet. Yeah, well, it's just I think when we're talking about this, we're talking about the very old fashioned idea yes. of a picture and a like, and the picture is you look nice and the likes mean you do look I'm nice. Saying that's old but, fashioned. but let me ask you a question Have you ever been depressed or, or upset if you have a streak with a friend? and the friend stops the streak? Upset, not depression. <laughs> so do you guys know what a streak I, I, is? I feel like I can speak too. I would say I'd be like depressed, but I'd be like, come on. It's like a bummer. It's just the same it's as like, like okay, in so a way. So I actually go slightly ahead. disagree with okay, that. Okay, good, I want to hear, let's talk. Um, so yeah, so what, the thing, I used to have like a very formulaic Instagram. I had Bisco Cam, I like memorized my little formula. <laughs> I deleted, so something I like to do is delete all of my editing apps, like I don't like Facetune, I don't like any of that, and when I do post a picture, I turn off my notifications, and I X out of the app, and of course I'll check for likes, and I'll be like, oh, I got half as many likes, that sucks, why did that happen? But I think not getting like the, con like scrolling through and seeing how many likes is huge, and I also, um, I, you know, I had Tumblr for years, and I never had any mental health issues, Instagram, like, I, I don't know, for me, likes have never really mattered, and I think it depends on your friend group, and if your friend group is all posting a certain thing, they can kind of, you know, be like, oh, why is blah, blah, blah posting this, this, and this, instead of what we're doing, but I, I, I don't think it's the same for every social media. I think it's flexible. No, it's yeah. definitely different, mm -hmm. but, but, I mean, there has been research on who, the types of photos young people actually like, and unfortunately, they are often playing into gender stereotypes. We often see the offline, maybe old media world reflected. So we'll pick up, the kids will pick up the representation, all of us will, from whatever we're consuming, and then we will reenact it online. So the, a large majority, and my daughter is unfortunately one of them, a large majority of kids will like you know, a, a physical picture, or a girl in a, you know, looking really cute, but that, then they won't like the picture of the sunset, you know? So you'll see these sort of, um, you know, 
tropes that play out in the real world or, or in old media happening online. In that vein, though, I don't think we necessarily should. Sh I think there's a lot of shame comes to women who post like sensual pictures. Like I, I posted a picture. Um, me and my friend made cinnamon buns, and I have a cinnamon bun <laughs> buns next to my boobs, and I posted a picture calling me "Don't call me sweet tits." Um, it was a funny caption. And then I, um, during the school, we did all of the walkout things that happened. I um, posted a video on Vice's Instagram page that went viral. I mean, not viral. But I, I don't it know. Went like, viral. Okay, um, um, and immediately all the comments were like, look at this 17-year-old expletive word. Um, like, what does she know about anything because she's posting these things? So I think in this dialogue, it's also not, it's important to not shame know, people. Yeah, not shame it. people. Yeah. And I think that actually a lot of autonomy can come from posting sexual pictures of yourself. We have another question. But, yeah, I, there's so many things. <laughs> I, uh, can I make one comment just to, to speaking to the, what's happening when, at this age? Um, this is not just true for social media, this is true for everything. When a person is between roughly, let's say, the ages of 12 and a half, 13, until maybe 16 to 18, there are a number of brain changes going on. There's, there's brain and body changes that ultimately translate to feeling things more <laughs> in good and bad ways. So the highs and the joys and the love um, and the excitement you feel about certain things are gonna be arguably higher than they will at any other point in time in your life. And the same is true for the lows. And that's where the, you know, the like button and what it means to get a lot of validation from things like this can fire off in your brain, parts of excitement in your brain, much higher than they will if this happened when you were eight years old and when this will happen when you're 25 years old. And so it's just kind of a to be aware. Mm -hmm. This isn't necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. It's just the way we're programmed and how we develop as people. And it's much easier to look back, but those years are incredible times in one's life and they're also uh, very difficult in terms of dealing with a lot of emotions and feelings that come up. And so the note is, if you're finding things bring you down a lot, try and pay attention to that. And you know, maybe it's not the best time to be posting things if you're vulnerable. We have one last question. On that point. Um, you've all heard the saying, if the product is free, it's because you're the product. Ooh, and we've no. been observing the Facebook interrogations on in Congress. And so for that reason, as a digital skeptic who was, in fact, a candidate for John Ronson's survey of shaming on social media, as journalist professionals, as healthcare professionals, you would be aware that the services that you provide are not done for free and that the conversation eventually will shift to this point, that these are private platforms conducting affairs as if they are public commons. And at some point, I do sincerely believe that the conversation will shift to address the implications of that. I hope this is relevant to the conversation at hand. Thank you. At what point do some of these kids get so comfortable being on social media that it becomes an avoidance of interacting outside of the social media with their friends and becomes very isolating because they're having such a good time on social media, maybe a little shy anyway, so it's an excuse mm -hmm. to not go out and mingle? I don't think it's a very formulaic thing. I don't think there's like the capital A, capital O, capital P at one point that it happens. I think a lot of people look at our generation like kind of like um, aquarium-esque, like we're fishes in a completely <laughs> different tank. And I think we're humans just like growing up in the way that we, it, growing up using the resources that have been provided to us. And I think it's, it's not something that's very formulaic with us. It's just like, I mean, I don't wanna say like eat, sleep, breathe social media, but it's that natural. And I think, that when it comes to us using it, it's never something like, I don't, I don't think we're really as conscious about it as the doctors are and as the people who 
are out of that generation and are studying it, I think and there's different mindsets. And I think, and this is where I think part of what you were saying is there's individual differences. So, you know, some, some kids are introverts and yes, this medium may help them um, communicate better and may actually give them a social outlet. Or you know, there, is, there is research that's saying for autistic kids, it is actually a way they feel more comfortable communicating and sometimes um, they learn social, social learning through this online format and then they're able to use that in the offline world. So it's actually adaptive for them. And it's a nice way to build in um, social learning and communication skills. Um, for other kids, you know, there is research called Rich Get Richer, um, and meaning that if you're an extrovert too, as I think you are, we'll um, that away. you know, so if you're an extrovert, you know, you use this medium to make more friends and to connect to more people and be really social, you know, and then there's the social compensation theory where, you know, you use it because you feel unable to communicate in real life, so you use it, um, you use the medium to co um, compensate for your lack of social skills. So each person is different, and to refer back to the Goldilocks theory, that was a 17,000, it was done out of the UK, 17,000 um, participants, and they looked at um, how people use social media and what were the relationship with social media, and there was, you know, a, a too little, <laughs> just right, too much. There was this curvilinear relationship, and you know, there are going to be some people that are going to use it way too much, and it, they may be addicted, frankly. You know, the, the jury's out if this is a true addiction, but there are certainly kids that show those signs. And then there are going to be kids that don't use it at all, and that might be an issue too, especially in today's world. By and large, the majority of them are using it just right. That's a good note to end. Just add one, one more thing to that. Sorry. Just kidding. Um, I think if you see a change, um, an abrupt change than where people are, weren't using it very much and now they're suddenly escalating and it's, in, it's impacting the amount of uh, time that they're spending with their in real life friends. Or conversely, if they were you know, merrily posting along and suddenly there's an acute drop off um, in the amount of time they're spending online, that's a, a good time to check in and see what's happening with that kid. Yeah. Again, our incredible panel. I've learned so much tonight, so many insights. Thank you so much. And, and thank all of you for your wonderful questions. And as I said, the panel will be upstairs uh, just for a few minutes, for about 15 minutes. And please feel free to approach them individually with your questions if you felt that you had a question, a burning question, it wasn't answered. Thank you. <laughs>